National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. A lot of the room. Let me tell you something. Christmas Vacation is not my favorite Christmas movie. It's my favorite movie of all time of any kind of movie. For our home, it's been a Christmas tradition for years and years and years. Uh, but what happened about 10 years ago is our kids dropped out. They no longer watch it with us. And then about five years ago, Kathy dropped out. And uh, now our Christmas tradition uh, revolves around me watching it by myself, drinking eggnog and opening gifts I gave to myself. It's pretty much a perfect Christmas. If you have not ever seen it, first of all, warning if you're going to make this a, a little tradition in your own home and watch it with your kids, there is some language in it. I just need to warn you right off the hop about that. But there, here's the story. Clark Griswold wants to give his kids and his family the perfect Christmas, and everything goes wrong. The lights don't work, the turkey explodes, the tree burns down, the cat's electrocuted, the SWAT team comes in through the window and smashes everything, and then the sewer explodes when Cousin Eddie fills it with sewage from his motorhome. And uh, that's, you know, just a little snippet of it, and you get the picture, it just sort of goes on and on and on like that. How many of you have had a Griswold Christmas of your own, of your own sorts? <laughs> Only a few hands. Of the, we've actually had uh, several of them. In fact, we had one of them right here on Christmas Eve during our service. Want to hear the story? Well, I'm going to tell it whether you want to hear it or not. <laughs> and, and, and it went like this. We... Uh, we wanted to do everything perfect like we always do on Christmas Eve, and we had these beautiful candles on the stage, and they were in these uh, wreaths, and the wreaths were made out of plastic, which turned out not to be such a great idea. Because what happened was, while I was preaching, in the middle of my message, the candles burned down and caught the wreath on fire, and then one of our quick-thinking ushers ran up here, and instead, of, we have like fire extinguishers every 30 feet in this building, but instead, he grabbed the, the candle thing and raced across the room, <laughs> and it was flaming across. <laughs> Women were screaming, kids were cheering, they thought it was, they thought it was part of the, 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 you know, the whole show. There was molten plastic burning on the carpet all the way through. I mean, it was just a horrendous. He ran for the door with it. So, so anyway, we managed to get it together. I just made a few jokes about this, what hell's going to be like, and, you know, th that whole thing. And we managed to get the service back together. Five minutes later, guess what happens? Another one starts on fire. And so instead of, you know, doing what they did last time, race across the room with it, they did this, went over and they started stomping it like this, and there was molten plastic, and it was pretty much a complete bust. And uh, this is what I've discovered. Anytime you try to overplan anything, anytime your expectations are too great, you will probably be disappointed. Anytime you try to make your Christmas too perfect, it's just like weddings. I have the same thing with wedding. Every wedding I do, they always want everything to be perfect. And I always remind them if something doesn't go wrong, I will deliberately make sure something goes wrong because nobody should have a perfect wedding. This uh, couple were with the, uh, the pastor before the, the wedding, and, they, and the pastor asked them this, do you want a traditional or a contemporary? And the groom said, well, contemporary service for sure. So the pastor said, fine. Well, the day of the wedding, it was pouring rain, just pouring and pouring and pouring. And when the groom was getting out of the limo, he thought he better roll up his pants. So he rolled up his cuffs because the water was so wet. And when he got up onto the altar, there he was standing there with his cuffs rolled up, the pastor noticed it and turned to him and said, Psst, pull down your pants. <laughs> and at that moment, the groom said, I've changed my mind. I think I want the traditional service. <laughs> well, we're going to look at having a hap, hap, happy Christmas. And uh, if you have found Luke chapter 2, or if you haven't looked at the screen, that's where we'll be. And I'm going to start at verse 7. And uh, this is the familiar Christmas story. And it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in that same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shined around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Say great joy. Great joy. Good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For this 
is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is born Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Say on earth peace. On earth peace. Goodwill toward men. There was two things I had you say in that. And uh, one of them was, was great joy, and the other one was on earth peace. And, and we're going we're gonna to look at those things tonight. But I, I want to remind you of this, that, you know, sometimes we get uptight about Christmas. We, we get aggravated when we see what's happened to Christmas today. It's just too much, right? Like too much t celebration and too many decorations and too many sales and too much stuff. It just seems so overdone. Kathy pointed out to me on November 1st, that we were in the store and she said, look, it's November 1st and we went from the Great Pumpkin to Santa Claus in 24 hours, right? From October 31st to November 1st. And we've been celebrating Christmas for almost two months now. And you know, you could get aggravated about that, but I want you to think about the fuss and the bother that happened in the very first Christmas. There was just as much action in, uh, have you noticed the story? I mean, we've got the star in the east, and we've got the wise men coming, and we've got these extravagant gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. We've got a choir of angels appearing in the heavens. I mean, it's all going on, isn't it? I mean, it's a busy, busy, busy time. But here's, I guess, the point I want to make. I don't think we should ever despise Christmas. I love Christmas. I love the trees, and I love the presents, and I love all the stuff. I think it's great. But here's what we need to be careful, that we don't get so caught up in the fuss and bother that we miss the main event. Now, let me tell you a little story. It's a true story. It happened in the, in the 30s in the Great Depression. There was this uh, family, and they were struggling like most families were in the 30s, and the circus was coming to town, and their son asked if he could go to the circus. And the father said, I can't afford a ticket, even though it was only one dollar. He says, we can't afford to put food on the table. We certainly don't have a dollar to send you to the circus. But he said, if you want, you can work hard, and you can earn some money, and you can buy your own ticket. So for the next couple of weeks, the, the, the child busted his tail, and he got every odd job and worked literally for pennies. But after the end of the couple of weeks, he had managed to earn a whole dollar. Went down, bought the ticket to the circus, and then it was the day for the circus to come to town. And there this, the clowns and the animals were going down the street in this big, huge parade. And the, the little boy stood there clutching his ticket, and he was so excited. And then one of the clowns came right up to him and shook his hand. And he gave him the ticket. Gave him the ticket to the circus. And then he ran home, and he told his parents all about it. And he went on, and he was explaining and describing the circus to them. And then his father said, son, you didn't you didn't see the circus. You only saw the parade. The little boy didn't realize that what he saw was only... It's a sad story when you think about it. But when I think of Christmas, I think we see people do exactly the same thing. I think they get caught up in the Santa Claus parade and they miss the real event, the true event about what Christmas is, is all about. You know, in the story that we read here, and if you go cross-reference it with the story in, in Matthew chapter 1, you find out that there was actually two groups of people during the days of the birth of Christ. There was one group that was made up of the shepherds and wise men, and they were the ones who went and they sought after the Christ to find him. And then there was another group, though, that's mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, and it refers to Herod and all Jerusalem with him. And it says this of, of, of Herod and Jerusalem. It says, and Herod, when he heard the news about the king being born in Bethlehem, it says he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And then there was this other group that, we, and we just read it, said they experienced great joy. And when the wise men came, it said they experienced exceedingly great joy. So what was the difference? What was the difference between those that were greatly troubled and those that experienced great joy? There's only one difference. And the one difference is that those who sought after the child discovered joy and those who failed to do so were greatly troubled. And I, I love this picture of the wise men and the, and the shepherds. You know why? Because it actually covers everybody. The wise men and the shepherds, they're, they're old and young, rich and poor, educated and non-educated, Jewish and Gentile. All of the human race is representative in those, in those two groups of people. And when they came and sought out and found the Christ, it says they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. 
But here's a, what, what I think we are challenged with today. If I was to ask you this question, I know you'll know the answer. What is, what is the number one thing that people want out of life? Who can tell me? I heard a bunch of, they want to be happy, don't they? People want to be happy. It's become our highest aspiration in life. I'm not sure why, but it just has. Everybody wants to be happy. I just want to be happy. We hear that all the time, right? And they go to counselors, and the counselor will say, oh, you poor baby, you leave your wife, abandon your children, quit your job, run away with the circus. You deserve to be happy. That's what we hear. That's what we want to hear. Well, you know, I don't actually believe you deserve to be happy. Uh, you don't want to know what I think you deserve. Well, I've told you before, so I'm not going to tell you tonight. And, uh, and so we have this thing where people want to be happy. But the, the, the problem with happiness is happiness doesn't last. See, here's the thing about happiness. It's actually in Scripture. It's, it's not like it's bad. Happiness is not a bad thing. It's just not the highest aspiration of life. The Bible actually talks about happiness, and it also talks about joy. It didn't say these guys, when they found the Christ child, were happy. It says they had exceedingly great joy. Now, in the scripture, the word happy appears 30 times. The word joy appears 300 times. Because what, what God offers us is, is true joy. Because here's the difference. Joy comes from within. Happiness comes from without. Joy is something that it lasts forever. Happiness only lasts for a, a few moments. In fact, there are things that, it, it, you know, God actually offers you happiness on a few things. For example, it says that children will make you happy. Happy is the man whose quiver is full. Why don't we get offered joy? Because it doesn't last. Trust me, I've got kids, I know. And <laughs> that's the only explanation I can give you. And so here, here's, here's what you need to know about happiness. And this is where my, my title comes from, a hap, hap, happy Christmas. The word happy comes from the Middle English hap. And the word hap means chance or good luck. And really what it means is circumstance, like the word happenstance is, uh, is again, it, it, and do you really want to risk your life to, to happenstance, to chance? Do you really want to, to kind of roll the dice on it? There's a story of this, this gal, she's writing her final exam, and, and to her surprise, it's true and false, she couldn't believe her good fortune. And so she's sitting there flipping the coin and marking them off, flipping the coin, right? and she just rips through the exam in no time, right? True and false, flipping the coin, heads, tails. And so then she's just sitting there for about 20 minutes. Finally, about three minutes before the end of the exam, she starts flipping the coin again, frantically flipping. The, the teacher's been watching this whole thing, comes over and, and says to her, Are, is everything okay? She says, oh, no, I've been done the exam for 20 minutes now. I'm just going back and double-checking my answers. <laughs> but here's, you know, we want a little happiness in life. Who wouldn't? But here's, here's the problem. See, happiness is all about externals. It's all about circumstance. It's all about happenstance. And when, when something good happens to you, you, you're what? You're happy. That's the answer. This is, this, this is easy. Uh, and, when something, and when something doesn't good happen, then you're sad, right? And so we allow circumstances. And so we, what happens is we end up on this roller coaster of emotions when things are good or bad in, in our life. And, you know, there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing wrong with a little happiness in life. And you know what? Christmas, you should get a little happiness out of Christmas. I mean, when you get, a, you know, let's just be honest here. If you get a really, really great gift, what are you? The, the answer is always happy. It's, you know, I know you're thinking, isn't it supposed to be Jesus? We're in church. We're doing, we're doing happy tonight, all right? And so, so, you know, you get a really great gift, and you're, you're happy. But how long are you happy for? Well, at least until the next day, which is Boxing Day, right, where you can buy happiness for half price, right? 50% off on happiness. Let me tell you a little story to illustrate this. This is going to be probably more graphic than you want to hear, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, several years ago, my father passed away, and he passed away of colon cancer. And uh, when he was on his deathbed, he, he asked us this. He asked all our, us kids, he said, grown kids, he said, I want you to do something. I want you all to go and get a colonoscopy. I mean, what a, what a thing to say on your deathbed. But that's what he asked. He said, I want you checked. I don't want you to end up like I am. And, and so, you know, who wants to do that? I didn't. I was too young at the time to have it done. And, and yet, if your father asks you to do something on his deathbed, what do you do? Yeah, you do it. So you go and do it. And so, so anyway, I very reluctantly booked this procedure, and I went, and I was a little nervous about the whole thing. 
And, uh, and then my doctor told me this. He said, you know, we're going to give you this drug, and it's going to make you really dopey and goofy and stuff. So just so you know, so you don't drive and, and, and don't go to work. You can't go to work. You're going to make a mess. And so I thought, OK, I won't go to work or don't drive. i get a day off out of the deal. How bad could it be? And so then what happened, this was just sort of a, a circumstance, a, you know, s sort of a coincidence, was I was looking for a boat, and I thought, I get a day off. I was going to buy a boat, and I get a day off because I'm going to be, you know, having this procedure at 7 in the morning. I got the whole day. So I decided to, to go and buy this boat on the day right after, or right after this, this colonoscopy. So this was my plan. I had quite a good day planned out. And so, so I go in, and they give you this weird drug that, uh, that gives you this um, anterior grade amnesia, meaning you can't remember anything within a few moments you've forgotten again. And it's the weirdest drug. And so I get out of this procedure. I can't remember anything of it. To me, it was, you know, whatever. Kathy comes and picks me up. I'm in the lobby greeting people, big smile on my face. She says, Mark, I'm in the, I'm in the loading zone. Come on. I said, I got to greet these people. And I'm in like this super good mood because I'm basically high on drugs. And so, so we get in the car, and I said to her, so where are we going? She says, we're going to Minnesota. I said, what for? She said, to buy a boat. I said, to buy a boat? You're kidding me. <laughs> and so then we drive for about 10 minutes, and, and then I forgot. And I said, so where are we going? <laughs> and she says, we're going to Minnesota to buy a boat. I said, really? That's fantastic. 10 minutes later, I said, where are we going? She says, we're going to Minnesota to buy a boat. I went, oh, we're going to buy a boat. <laughs> We end up at Emerson, we're at the, at the customs. I said, what are we doing here? She says, we're going to Minnesota to buy a boat. And I went, woohoo, I'm going to buy a boat. I mean, I just kept on having this joy, you know, because I couldn't remember. It's, it's actually sort of one of the benefits of getting old and forgetful as well. You know that, don't you? I mean, every joke you hear, you're hearing for the first time. You meet new friends every day, and you can hide your own Easter eggs. And so, <laughs> so I'm having this super weird day. And we're driving there, and we, and we get there, and there's the boat, and it just looks fantastic. And I bought the boat, and I, and I get home. And so whenever he said, what was a colonoscopy like? I said, it's fantastic. You, you, you know, you got to get one. I said, you know, you go in, you wake up, and you've got a boat. <laughs> Now, I understand something about, uh, about boats. The, the, the two happiest days in a boat owner's life are the day you buy it and the day you sell it, and there's a bunch of expense and grief in between, but that's another story. And so, you know, I went around telling people how great it was to get a colonoscopy, right? And, you know, here's the thing. you got to remember, you know, every time you want to have a good day, you can't go out and get another colonoscopy. It doesn't work like that. You know, they have rules about these things. So about 10 years later, 10 years go by, the doctors call. It's time for another one. I think, fantastic. I can't believe my, my good fortune. I'm getting another colonoscopy. And so the first time I was all reluctant, this time I'm all excited. I'm getting another one. Couldn't wait. And so, so I go in there, and this is when things started to go south on me. I heard the nurse, while I'm lying on the operating table, before anything's really started and I got a needle in me, I heard the, the nurse say, his blood pressure has dropped. And I thought, that can't be a good thing. And so then the, I heard the doctor saying something about don't administer any drugs or something like that. And so as it turned out, my blood pressure dropped in some reaction to this anesthetic, so they decided to do it without. <laughs> and so the procedure began, and I can honestly say it was one of the most uncomfortable things in my life. And then I heard these words out of the doctor's mouth, words you never want to hear a doctor say. He said, oops. <laughs> Oops or not, oops is not the right word for a dog. I don't, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't even know how to say that word. And then I started screaming like a banshee. And I'm yelling and I'm screaming. And then the nurses start screaming at me and they say, Mr. Hughes, breathe. You have to breathe. I said, I can't breathe. I'm screaming. And so we had this shouting match and they wanted me to start doing Lamaze breathing. Apparently sort of same thing, you know, going on here. And uh, so what had ended up happening was he took a left turn instead of a right, apparently. Uh, that wasn't good. No anesthetic. Kathy picked me up. I was not in the lobby. Glad handing people and giving people high fives. It was seriously one of the most uncomfortable experiences of my life. So when people say to me, should I get the procedure? I'm conflicted because it could really go either way. <laughs> 
I guess what I'm really trying to say to you, the moment we get to that place where we're always looking for the fix, we're always looking to buy the new thing or the new car or the, or the new present or whatever, we live on this roller coasters of emotions where we're basing everything on external circumstances. And see, that's what happiness is. And great if you get a little happiness out of Christmas, right? I mean, I, I, got, I got the letter from the bank yesterday. It said from the bank, happy holidays, the politically correct happy holidays. And then in small print it said, if you are already having a happy holiday, please disregard this notice. I don't know what was that was all about. But see, what we're really looking for in life is not happiness, we're looking for joy. And you see, joy doesn't come from outside. Joy doesn't have anything to do with externals. Joy is something that comes from within. Joy is something that, that I mean, you look, at, you look at the Mary, Jesus, and Joseph, and you look at that moment, and it wasn't a great external moment. They were in a stable, for goodness sakes. But in the midst of that, what, would you, what do we discover? We discover this joy. And see, I can't really describe joy to you except to say it's inexpressible. It is miraculous. It's something you can't buy, you can't manufacture it. But what happens at Christmas when you discover this great thing called the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came to the earth and then ultimately died for your sins so that you will have an eternity in heaven, you know what? That should produce in you an inexpressible joy that cannot be described. You know, there's a Chinese proverb and it goes like this. It says, if you want to be happy for an hour, take a nap. If you want to be happy for a day, go fishing. If you want to be happy for a week, take a vacation. You want to be happy for a month, get married. If you want to be happy for a year, win the lottery. But if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, find someone to serve. You see, that last one is not really happiness, is it? That last one's actually joy, because it's not about what you get. It's not about, it's not about externals and circumstances in your life. But it's about changing your perspective and getting it off yourself. One of my favorite stories actually appeared in Chicken Soup for the Christmas Soul. They have chicken soups for everything. You know this, don't you? And it's a story of a woman named Jill Robertson. She was single mom, had two daughters, and it was going to be a pretty lean Christmas, and the school where her kids went knew it. And so what they did was they put together a hamper for her, and this hamper arrived at the door full of goodies and, and, and candies. And there was two Barbie dolls sitting right on top. And she just hid the two Barbie dolls when the girls came in the door. And the girls said, what's this? And she said, the school sent a hamper. And the girls said, well, there must be some mistake. We're not poor. And she watched as her little girls loaded the hamper onto their red wagon and walked it down to the street and gave it to the immigrant family down the street that had just moved in. Said, no, they're poor. They have nothing. And she watched as, as that wagon of, of all the Christmas treats went out of the house. And that Christmas, she said, was the leanest Christmas she had ever had. They had craft dinner and one Barbie doll for each girl. But she said, it was easily the best Christmas ever because I discovered that day what Christmas was all about. It wasn't about what we get or what we have or even all of the externals around us. It was about something that happens deep within our soul. So the first thing that the scripture promises us on Christmas is, is joy. The second thing is peace. On earth, peace and goodwill towards all men. Peace on earth, huh? Is that what it's promising? If that's what it's promising, no offense, but God's not doing a very good job. I mean, the world's a mess. There's no earthly peace. In 5,600 years of human history, recorded human history, we've only had 300 years of peace, and that was when there was barely any people here. Now that we've got all these people, there's wars everywhere in the world. In fact, the Bible doesn't promise world peace, neither does Jesus. He told us on several occasions that I did not come to bring you peace. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But at the same time, he offered us peace. The 900, sorry, 790 times in scripture, the word peace is used. But you know, it's not used about world peace for the most part, except to say we don't have it. You know how it's used? It talks about peace with God, peace with yourself, and peace with others. The first and the most important type of peace is is peace with God. And you know where we find it? We find it in the song that we sing on Christmas, Hark the Herald. Hark the Herald, angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, finish it for me. 
God and sinners reconcile. See, the only real peace that we have is the peace that we have when God and we are reconciled. Then we get peace with God. That's the kind of peace it's talking about here. And we get it only when we can make peace with our God, right? And at the end of people's lives, the one thing they want more than anything else is they want the peace of God. They want to know that they've made peace with their maker. It's the most important thing, and that's what Christmas is all about. It's about peace with God, but it's also about peace with yourself. You see, I think we've over-sanitized the Christmas story, don't you? I and mean, we have the beautiful manger scene, the crash. It looks so, so perfect, so sanitized. You know, clean animals and clean shepherds and clean wise men and this beautiful little baby in a little wooden manger with some straw and a, and a dinner plate behind his head, right? <laughs> That's supposed to be a halo. I want you to think of something. You know, Mary, and, Mary and Joseph and Jesus were not at home. They, didn't even have, they weren't even at home. They were in a foreign city to them, Bethlehem. And they, there was no room at the inn, so they ended up in the stable surrounded by poop. And the, and the baby that was born was laid in a manger. That sounds nice. That's a feeding trough that animals eat out of. And, and not only that, there was a reason why they were in Bethlehem. Caesar was doing a census so that he could tax everybody. That was the whole purpose of this. So that meant, you know, they got those great, wonderful gifts. I got news for you. You pay GST and PST on gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, and, and probably capital gains on the gold as well. I mean, they're going to get taxed, taxed through the wazoo. I know that. That's what's going to happen here. And we look at this story, and yet in the midst of it, with nothing, in a barn, having your baby in a barn, they had this incredible sense of peace. And see, you know what I've discovered about the Scripture? The Scripture tells us, Jesus says, my peace I give you. And the peace that he gives us, he says, is not of this world. He said, be anxious, this is in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. He says, you won't even understand it. It surpasses all understanding. See, here's how anxiety works. You actually, I don't need to tell you this, you already know how it works. Anxi anxiety works like this. You start thinking about something, and you're thinking and thinking and thinking, and your mind becomes exhausted with it, and then it begins to move down, and it becomes a knot in the pit of your stomach, right? And then you just get all tied up in knots. This scripture said that the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, which can't even be understood, will guard your heart and your mind. You know what happened to me yesterday? I was trying to do some year-end banking, and I'd phoned the bank. I'd spent maybe you know, 29 hours on the phone with them. You know how that works. And I'd sorted, sorted this out, and I was pretty happy about it. And I told Kathy, I said, I sorted all this out. Then two days later, I still haven't heard from them, so we phoned them up at the bank, and I said, are you gonna, able to do this? And they said, no, we can't do it. Why would you think we'd do that? I just spent 29 hours on the phone with them, and now they're telling me we can't do it. And I got all aggravated. And I was all mad because the bank wasn't gonna do this for me. And, and, and then I realized, here I was just before Christmas, all aggravated about banking. And I'm thinking, really? I'm going to let this? I was transgressing the message I was going to preach today. So I thought, I better sort this out in a hurry so I can preach this with some integrity. And I found myself all caught up in this. And I thought, in the greater scheme of things, does it really matter? It's only m money. Does it really matter in the greater scheme of eternity? Does it really matter in the greater scheme of anything? No. And I think what happens is we get all caught up in these moments, and I thought, it doesn't matter. Here was Mary and Joseph that were actually, think about this, they were Middle Eastern refugees, weren't they? Chased out of, of, of their own country by a tyrant and d relying on the kindness of strangers. Think about that. And how are you and I doing? We're living in this amazing nation called Canada with freedom to worship and freedom to earn a living and roofs over our heads and food on the table. We have so much to be thankful for. Why would we ever get anxious at Christmas time? So the first kind of peace is, is peace with God. The second kind of peace is peace with yourself. But the third kind of peace is, is peace with others. And you know why we don't have peace with others? Because we don't have peace with ourselves and we don't have peace with our God. And the less peace people have with their God, the less peace they'll have with others. And that's why there's so much conflict in the world. I want to just show you one little thing about this verse we just read. I'm going to throw it up on the screen because I want to show you something. This is what our verse said. It said, 
and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. That sounds so wonderful. It sounds like earthly peace and goodwill towards all men. It's actually not translated right in the King James. And it actually should be, read like this. And on earth peace to men of goodwill. That's completely different, isn't it? That the peace is actually to men of goodwill or people of goodwill. And what we really need to be thinking about at Christmas time is bringing the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding to influence and change the lives of people around us. Let me close with one final story here tonight about this. It's not exactly a Christmas story, but I think it sums it up nicely. A few years ago, I was in, in Toronto, and I was speaking to a crowd of about 300 people, and I was talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that's reconciliation, and how we need to forgive everybody all the time. It's one of my slogans. And I was talking about how we need to forgive everybody all the time. And I was telling them there is no person, no relationship that is so broken that cannot be fixed. And that if we would be humble, and if we would be forgiving, and if we would be repentant, we can fix any relationship. Well, well, while I was talking about this, there was a man, his name was Peter. He was sitting in the third row. And Peter had had a falling out with his very best friend. They were best friends through, through school. And then after school, they lived together in an apartment, and then they were best friends, and they did everything together. And they had some arguing about something. He never told me what it was. And it broke off their friendship, and they moved apart, and he had not spoken to his friend. His friend's name was V. And he said he had not spoken to V for two years. Had not spoken to him. And so while I was speaking and talking about how you can forgive everybody all the time and reconcile any relationship, he decided that what he was going to do was he was going to leave that meeting that night, he was going to get his car, and he was going to drive across to the north side of Toronto, and he was going to knock on V's door, and he was going to apologize to him, and he was going to reconcile that relationship. But what happened was he stood up at the dismissal of the meeting and turned around, and three rows behind him was his friend V. Now understand this. This is in a city of seven or eight million people. There's 300 people in this room. What are the, ch what are the chances of his friend being three rows behind him hearing the same message about forgiving everybody all the time. And within moments, they had forgiven one another, they had embraced one another, and they had reconciled that relationship. You know, when I think about that, when I look at this peace on earth, peace towards men of goodwill, I think, what could be, what could be better on Christmas during any Christmas season than to, to reconcile a relationship? to find someone to forgive, to be those people, those agents of peace in our world. When we find peace with ourselves and peace with God, we can find peace with others. And what would be better than to righting a wrong or changing a life or ministering hope into another person? That's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? You see, there is a great joy and there is a great peace that comes from above. When we embrace Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we find something that is so wonderful and so tremendous. We find this inexpressible uh, joy and this, this peace that is beyond description. You see, the gospel is very simple. We all blew it. I mean, sure, I know we inherited the, the sins of Adam and Eve. I understand that part. But you see, the scripture says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. But then he says this, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. Finding that peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with others, and joy inexpressible. See, Jesus is the reason for the season, and wise men still seek him today. Let's stand together, shall we? I want to ask you to do a favor for me. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment, if you would. And there may be people in here, and you have not got to that place where you yourself have made peace with God, where you haven't sought to find the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And I want to give you, and what better opportunity than on Christmas Eve to make that decision? I'm going to make this really easy for you. I'm not going to single you out, call you forward. I'm not going to ask you to say anything publicly. It'll be very simple. But right where you are, if you're not sure you have peace with God tonight, if you've never invited Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior, I'm not asking you if you've been to church or been baptized as an infant. I'm asking you this. Have you had the definitive moment where you found Christ for yourself as your own Lord and Savior? And if you'd like to do that tonight, nobody's looking around, and I will not call you forward. 
But if you'd like to do that tonight, I want you to just slip up your hand so I can see it just for a moment. Just take a moment and slip up your hand. There's hands that are going up around the room. Just join these folks. Take a moment. By raising your hand, I know that this is what you want to do. All right, you can put down your hands. And I said I wouldn't single anybody out, so we're all going to pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross. The 2,000 years ago, you were born into this world, born to die for me and my sin. And then you rose again on the third day, and you forever live to be my Lord. Today, Lord, I ask for that joy, that inexpressible joy, and for that peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' mighty name, I receive it. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand tonight, shall we?